Well, <laughs> your initiatives, I don't think there would be so much activities going out on in the Island world today. So, thank you. <laughs> and the report from the trenches. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, you happen to be my very favorite people in the world, very favorite kind of people, very favorite people. Um, it's true. People who work with me actually know that. Okay. Um, but I'm not one of you. Not really. Um, I'm fat, female, 50, not very good at computers. Really not. I have a hard time printing out. Monica asked me to print something out and bring it this morning. The computer didn't work. Hell, fuck. <laughs> um, so, since I'm not really one of you, but I like you so much, what can I do? Well, I'm actually pretty useful. I make your ideas into reality. Okay? That's my job. That's what I do over and over again. I'm never the one that comes with the idea. I'm never the one that builds a product. I just build a company or get whatever it is done. It's a skill too, okay? It's useful. Um, so anyway, I've had three chances in my life of being in, um, working with people like you, only three. One was at Stanford. I went there and became part of the group that worshipped computers, um, early 80s. But then I graduated and had to get a job, moved, fell in love with a Swede and moved to Sweden. Of all things. So, you know, that was gone and over about two years later, three years later. And then I found this, my, my husband had sold a company and I, th I didn't want to work so hard anymore and I was, it was in summer, Sunday morning. And I read the whole paper, you know, the obituaries and the want ads and everything, and uh, found this ad for a sales manager for airline systems. And I thought about it, I said, well, you know, what would I really like in a job? Well, I want to work with really good technical people, deep technical competence, that's first. And then I'm really tired now because I've been working like hell at Talia. So I want something kind of sleepy and slow, thanks. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, yeah, and I'm, what, what skills do I have? Well, I'm a, I'm a good technical salesperson, or a reasonable one anyway, so I can do that. So I applied for the job, and thank goodness got it. And uh, yeah, that was number two. Uh, two months after I arrived at Airline Systems, Airline F Ericsson forbid the use of Airline in its new products. So things got a little bit hairy. Uh, Joachim Grey-Avenue came up with a very good um, product idea which I replied to saying, well, who would buy it and why, and who, why would anybody buy the first one? And uh, I was told to go help him. So I moved to CS Lab, okay? Uh, okay, so once again, Yuki's idea, I follow along. Sure, okay, who would buy it, why, what, what does it need to do? Not my idea, just let's put it into a box. Huh? Okay, at CS Labs then, uh, Hulk and Milroot had a really good idea. Let's make airline open source. And I said, open source, what's that? He explained, and I said, hmm, interesting. Never heard of that before. So he gave me a paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. I read it, and then I read it again, and I read it again, and thought, oh, okay, yeah, we can do this. Ericsson wanted airline spread, okay? They'd spent five years with airline systems trying to get it spread, trying to sell it, and ended up with an internal consulting organization and nothing else, no external customers. Um, if airline wasn't spread, then there was a good chance that the uh, language would rot, uh, that there wouldn't be enough people using it, so it would be a good career move to use, Ericsson, to use airline or learn Ericsson. New exciting things would happen in the world, and airline wouldn't be part of it, right? So it would rot, and people wouldn't want to do it, and it would be bad for Ericsson. So they decided, for very good reasons, to forbid the use of airline in new products. Extremely good reasons. So it's impossible to sell something out of Ericsson if Ericsson itself refuses to use it, right? Absolutely impossible. So what can we do? We can give it away, which is open source. Um, all right. 
So who decides that, and how do I persuade them? And ooh, lots of pressure in the computer science CS lab group. Everybody was very unhappy. We were considering very, we were discussing in great detail how to murder a certain people. And we had <laughs> very, I remember Mike said that, well, this person has a boat, and I would just take my, I learned how to dive and not tell anybody about it, and then swim underwater with one of these really fancy things with no bubbles behind it, and put a, put a sort of a limpet mine on the boat. You've seen this in James Bond, I'm sure. <laughs> and I was thinking of much bloodier things. But yeah, um, <clears throat> we uh, found out who would decide this, and okay, started to persuade, and started to persuade, and Erickson's management was saying, well, you know, maybe, but geez, what about patents? What if we're infringing somebody's patents? We have no idea, oh my God. So I went back to CS Lab and gathered the gang, and I remember this clearly. A whole bunch of people staring at me saying, right, and how likely is it that this will happen? I said, oh, about 60%, but if we don't get the patents fixed, then it won't happen, that's for sure. So Klake and Joe went and looked at the patents and did what was necessary. I can't do that, right? I have no idea about all that stuff. But they did, and they fixed it, and it was done. And in December of, was it 98? We got Ericsson, we got uh, Erlang out as open source. It was amazing. Most of us didn't believe it would actually stay open source. So, <laughs> Yes, Joe, that's true. We, a lot of people set up, not me, because I can't do that, um, set up like copies. So the, the instant, the second that it was put out open source with the right license, they copied it into their own machines and they got a copy with the right license on it. Okay? It was a big deal. Um, so Ericsson wanted Erlang sold. They, employ, they employed me for the project of getting Erlang spread. They didn't really care about the money involved in Erlang. They wanted airline spread far enough so that Ericsson could continue to use it or start to use it again. That's worked, okay? It's worked. Airline, uh, judging by those curves that Barry Bjarne was saying back there, airline has been growing. People have been coming and it's really working, okay? Bjarne said something which was also one of those ideas, okay? Remember, I don't have the ideas. It's really too bad, I wish I did, but I don't. Bjarne said, you know, you know, there's only really two steady states for Ericsson, for, for Erlang. It's either a secret weapon for Ericsson, which will allow Ericsson to develop software products, reliable software products that nobody else will be able to do, or it's spread over the world. And everybody uses it and knows it as an appropriate tool for doing some things, for building reliable systems. In between there, there's an opportunity. Mm. Maybe I better get back to be my being a kind of a strange character. Um, when I was visiting CS Labs for the first time, I was, for some extremely good reason, wearing a skirted suit and heels. I don't generally wear that, but I was wearing a skirted suit and heels, which was a terrible mistake. And wa walking on a, talking on a mobile phone, walking down the corridor to find my new room, which was going to be beside Bjarne's. And not many people were wearing hard-soled shoes in the CS lab. Certainly not high-heeled pumps. So there came out a few heads poking out of the rooms behind me. <laughs> Who's that? I hear this clearly. And, <laughs> and then I hear, and I know exactly who said this, but I'm not going to say exactly who said it. Who's that? She's going to work here. No. <laughs> yeah. She'll never fit in. And they made sure I wouldn't, because I have trouble with computers. <clears throat> and um, I couldn't get anything printed out for three months, and nobody would help me. Okay? This is what's known as mobbing, guys. You are now forgiven, but I, and I learned how to read lots of long documents on the screen. <laughs> like the Cathedral in the Bazaar, right? So I don't fit in, I know it, right? But I do like you, and I do make useful things out of it, but I'm a strange character and can't get the damn printer to work now. Uh, yeah, another thing about being a strange character, last time I was here over in, um, oh, in the center of the city, I guess it was, 
I appeared for dinner and sat down at some table uh, near, and the table was sort of split into two groups, one whom I knew and one whom I didn't. And the ones who I knew were in some lively conversation about something I didn't understand at all. And the other ones looked at me and said, this woman looks probably homeless. She's here for a free meal. Can we help you? Who are you? And I reply, well, who are you? They recognize you. Well, we do this and that and the other for this project. And I said, oh, well, oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, who are you? Well, I got a hairline out open source, actually. And they looked like, and then looked over at the other people on the table. And I think it was Clacky who said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, well, yeah, yeah, can I get you some salad? <laughs> right, fine, I was allowed to have dinner. But yeah, I do look really weird here anyway. So, yeah, I make ideas into reality, right? It's a different skill set than many of you do. I mean, you guys make your ideas into reality by building products, usually. Uh, I make them into companies, or persuade them through management, or something like that, get money for them, that sort of thing. Um, and humans are specialized, right? That's why we've overrun the planet, we're specialized. We need to have a set of different skills, and if you've got too many of one kind and not enough of the other, things don't work so well. You wouldn't believe the number of companies I've seen who have nobody like you in them and think they're going to manage. They won't. <laughs> Just won't. Okay, so this idea about airline and open source. Håkan Milru today, at least he was the one who persuaded me about it, you know, do this. Well, what's that? Okay, here, learn more. Good idea. Uh, right, okay, let's plan it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this can work and get it done. Uh, and then all of them lost patience as the Ericsson, uh, as, as it took a while to persuade Ericsson manager to take such a very momentous decision. It, it's a big decision, okay? And it took a while, and people were very frustrated and started to fantasize about murdering people. <clears throat> right? So this Ericsson is a secret weapon. In uh, Erlang is a secret weapon with Ericsson. That was very important at the time. Okay. Joe Armstrong said something at the time as well. They are putting intolerable pressure on a bunch of very smart people, and they think we're going to be crushed. We won't. We're going to shoot out the side. You know what? We did. We shot out the side. This was a group called Blue Tail. Okay. Blue Tail's team was formed in the worst possible manner, absolutely terrible. None of the guys except me, and I wasn't a guy, had ever met a customer. Most of them had no, but no buttons on any shirts they owned. Uh, generally wore socks with their sandals and were perfectly lovely people and could do miracles, right? Um, so I was the only one who knew anything about money or sales or customers or anything like that. And I, said, and I was going, and they said, let's start a company. I'm going, do you realize how much work it is? Oh, my God. Oh. Well, and, and, and then I thought I came up with a wonderful, the, the way to kill all possibilities of making a company. We have to have a business idea first. <laughs> because nobody ever has a business idea, right? It just, these things are, are like golden eggs, they're goose legs, they just don't exist. So I thought that this was a way to keep them quiet for the next 10 years or so. And they'll come up with something lousy, you know. Open a hairdressing salon, something like that. <laughs> Terrible. So they said, oh, that's no, I, no problem at all. What do you mean, it's no problem at all? Well, we have lots of business ideas. We've been sort of saving the ones we send on postcards to, to each other so that somebody hoping somebody will read them on the way and do something with them. True, this is what people said. <laughs> okay. So I said, oh, let's meet at, I think it was at Joe's place, in a week, and we'll go through them. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. Oh, I'll be at Joe's place in a week, not a problem, but uh -huh. we had 42 business ideas. It was amazing, okay? So what do you do with 42 business ideas? And this is part of what, okay, so what do you do? You say, well, you've got to choose. Well, what do we want in a business idea? Well, we were all employed at Ericsson at the time, so the first thing was Ericsson shouldn't get completely, crazily mad at us with this business idea. So that cut off about half of them, right? Next one, right, well, we're young and new in a startup, and if we can think of a competitor to the idea right now without doing any research, 
then the market is already established, there's already a leader, we're too late. If you can't think of them right away, then there's probably still a chance. But if you can think of them right away, given you have 42, let's you know, throw those away. Okay, still a bunch left. I forget exactly how many. Let's call it 10 left. And I said, well, right, I'm the only salesperson around here, and I only do business-to-business -business sales. Well, I can do business-to-consumer. Nowadays, I can do business-to-consumer, but back then, I really couldn't. All right, so it has to be business-to-business, -business, no business-to-consumer ideas. And besides, they're expensive. When you have to market to consumers, you have to spend lots of money because you have to get message into lots of people's brains, and it's hard. Okay, so, half of, so, so around half of them disappeared then, and then, okay, and we want a product idea where we can have, sell a new product to the same customer over and over again. So you can have a, sell a suite of products to the same customers over time. We had two ideas left, and we voted, and it turned into clustering on the internet, basically. Um, it worked really well uh, in some ways. We sold it for, what, $150 million after 18 months, um, which is good. However, okay, what's wrong with it? 12 founders, 11 incredible techies, and me. It's a little bit unbalanced, slightly. Um, so you need to, have, it's really wrong. When you're building a team, you generally want to have even power between the numbers of people, amount of intelligence, amount of drive between the technical side and the commercial side just about even. If you employ a new tech, you really ought to employ a new salesperson, something like that, right? About even. So 12 to one wasn't even. And it became quite clear that we weren't making enough sales. We made very little sales in Blue Tails history. And we could develop incredible amounts of products very quickly. So we made a deal with a company to develop a product for them while I was trying to sell the I and on Louise and a couple more were trying to sell um, what we had to ISPs. Uh, and that's where we sold the company, was to the people we did the OEM product to. And then they threw out the, those of us who were uh, not techie quite quickly. Right, so, Ericsson not mad at us. Not too much competition yet, right? The right kind of, of business, the kind of business, well, I was gonna need, I needed to have them help me sell. And the only way somebody like and the only way anybody who was involved in Blue Tail was going to be able to help sell was if it's going to be a deeply techie sell where people love deeply techie people and really loves gurus. If you're looking for somebody writing, you know, with, with fashion or whatever, it's not going to work, right? So you look at what the group you have, and you say, okay, well, what can we actually do? Looks like deep techie sales, it's probably something with reliable systems, uh, more. Um, and then you say, well, maybe this idea here, maybe clustering, right? And what, new, what more skills do we need? And let's bring that person in or think about who we could possibly bring in. You start building the idea and the group in sort of a iterative process until you get down to usually about even numbers of commercial and, and, and techie people. Usually an idea that has various different bits about it that are really good. And then you go for it. It's not really all that difficult, and you can get to that point within about a day or two once you have the idea. Of course, I never had the idea, but Joe had 42, or the gang had 42. So. Um, right. About the team building. If you, Klarna, who's all over the place here, once upon a time, I was invited to a, I, I was an investor at the time after Blue Tail. Um, I was invited to a Christmas party December 2004, uh, at the incubator at Handels School, it's at Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, I was gonna, oh, I don't really wanna go. Well, Ingela's there, and it's always fun to drink lots of wine with Ingela. So I went there, found Ingela, and was on my third glass of wine, I believe, maybe fourth, uh, when the evening's entertainment came up, which was all the little companies that were in that incubator were gonna make a little presentation. And, um, there was some blonde guy talking about a billing system for the NAT. Hey, now that's a good idea. And Ingela, who studies entrepreneurship, watches me put down my glass of wine and go find that guy. <laughs> okay. And 
I, would, I didn't recognize him. So Ulf, uh, the guy that I did know who'd invited me there, said, I said, who's the guy with the billing system? And he said, oh, that one over there. It turned out to be not the one who'd presented. It turned out to be Seb, right? Nicholas had presented it and Seb, but I didn't know that, so I found this blonde guy and asked him a few more questions, and drunk as I was within about, and it got really loud there, so we went over by the, where the coats were hanging, and okay, more, more, okay, right, I'll do this. So within an hour, we decided on doing a deal together because I knew what technology, because Karna's idea fit Erlang. I knew that there were people, really good people in Erlang that had extra time, and they needed a little money and that I could give them, and I knew how to start companies, and they were really, three really, really good uh, business people. So we had th a, a good strong group of business people to match the good strong group of techies already from the beginning. So that was really good. It was all decided within about an hour on the way away from there. I think I called Yohan Bey Vermeer and said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got the new one. By, I think, April, we had the, net, the first customer in. That was pretty amazing. That was Yohan Bey Vermeer, Martin Björklund, Jukke Grebene, uh, Krakke, oh, and Håkan Nilrot who did that. Pretty damn amazing. So, what was good about Klarna? What made me go, wow, that's perfect. Well, first of all, I've been looking for an airline-based idea in order to be able to work with people like you again. I hadn't found it for a while. Um, second of all, it had a lot of good high margins, okay? So, if you, make, if you have good margins, then you can make a mistake and you're not dead. If you have low margins and you make a mistake, you're either dead or you're talking to VCs again. I've done that um, in Ellen, which is a probiotic company. We had too low margins and it was a constant fight for money because we couldn't, in the startup, you know, we'd make a mistake and there'd be a problem in production or something and all the money would be gone immediately, right? Whereas in Klarna, the, the, the margins were pretty high, okay, very high. Um, another thing about it was, okay, it was business to consumer, but the sales process was business to business, which I can understand, okay, this is good. It was a pretty clear value proposition. If you put this into your website, you will sell more. You will sell 30% more. Which is, a, and then the business, the, the e-shop itself can decide, okay, well, if I sell 30% more, then it's worth quite a bit. And they didn't charge much, but it was still a high margin. So this was a very clear value proposition. And it, in addition, it didn't require behavioral changes from people like me. I know how to pay a bill. I'm a little bit leery of waving my mobile phone near some terminal and having money deducted from my account. Because my mobile phone, yeah, it's mostly my pocket, but not always. <laughs> And so that there, there's a certain, there's a real attraction in new companies that build on the same behavior that everybody already knows, okay? You don't want to go in and say that now everybody will change behavior. Some people manage that, Facebook has managed that, but most people can't do that. So, after Blue Tail, what happened? Uh, there was a bunch of, of companies up here sponsoring this place, okay? There's Klarna, there's Synapse, there's Taylor, there's Coralothus, there's Ericsson again, right? Big time Ericsson again. Um, airline Consulting, Airline Systems, Foyer Labs, I, I don't know. There was some there that I had, Cubic, there were some there that I really didn't recognize, right? So, huge explosion. There's been a deluge, an incredible number of companies started. I think Partly because of the opportunity, because airline does make it possible to build reliable systems, and also because enough of us were out there, we made money in, in Blue Tail, and we're out there ready to start the next company. So there are then Blue Tail's children, like Klarna and Synapse. And then right now I'm working one of Blue Tail's grandchildren called Techno Networks, because the money from there actually comes, well, partly from synapse, and people come partly from synapse, so it's actually Blue Tail's grandkid. It's kind of fun. And there are a lot of us like that, okay? There's a lot of companies out there. So, and I think we're all exploiting the same opportunity that we can actually, build, we know how to build reliable, or you know how to build reliable systems. Um, 
fairly easily. Uh, and there's a lot of systems that really ought to be reliable. So let's do it. And you build one thing or the other, right? After Blue Tail for me, remember I just take other people's ideas and make them reality, not my own, right? Well, okay. I'm kicked out of the nice group of you guys. Nortel didn't want me there anymore because they were, they, well, Nortel was a bit of a problem. Uh, they uh, had cheated on their bookkeeping, not once, but I think twice or three times, and they were, had gone, went from Canada's biggest company to uh, bankrupt pretty quickly. But anyway, I, I started 10 more companies. 10. So I'm on my 10th now. Of them, four were just investments where I was maybe on the board a little bit. Of those three have gone badly. Uh, and uh, I've been very active in Lensway. I think many of you know of Lensway. Uh, contact lenses on the network, and on the net there. That was fun. That was 15% um, growth per month. And I was there one day a week, so 15 to 20% growth. So every time I came, I said, well, hello, Daniel, who's an entrepreneur. Is there a crisis? Yes, there is. Okay, then I go fix, I then pack lenses or whatever it is. Or, hello, Daniel, is there a crisis? Not at the moment. Okay, the company's 5% bigger than it was last week. How are you using your time? <laughs> <laughs> is there any chunk of stuff you've been doing we should employ somebody for? Right. It was really fun, and within what well, was about two years, we went from four people starving in a basement to 55 people and 100 million in, in turnover and 10 million on the bottom line, and, and solid. That was fun, okay. but it wasn't airline. And it was not my idea, of course, but I don't mind. Um, we also, I did um, Panopticon, which is data visualization for the finance industry, which is going really well until around 2008 when the finance industry sort of went wrong, and now is going very well again. Um, not you guys, unfortunately. Um, I did Ellen, which is probiotics for women, medical technology. When I was president, we listed it because we needed money, we always needed money, right? Uh, and uh, got a few customers and started to spread the probiotic tampons around the world. Was it Toby? Also somebody else's idea? If you look at a computer screen, you can see if you, Toby's got cameras and sensors and stuff, so they can tell where you're looking on the screen. And for handicapped people, badly handicapped people, if they look at one space, direct, one place direct, uh, excuse me, my Swedish is interfering, long enough, then it's click, right? So you can, have a keyboard up there and click and actually spell stuff, write stuff, and get the computer to type it for you. May I have a hamburger, please? That sort of thing. Uh, you can write your memoirs when you have uh, motor neuron disease, ALS. Um, it was a good idea. Uh, there I did something a little bit different and went from, took the gang from 4.6 million euros in turnover the year before I started to 4.6 million euros uh, the quarter I left in two years, okay? So look, again, not my idea, really good technology, and right, so let's just make a company out of it. And I do. And um, all right, let's see if I do this. Right, right now, I'm doing something called Teclo Networks. Teclo, it's Luke Gore's idea. I'm sure some of you know him. Uh, Sean Hine is involved. I'm sure some of you know him. Tony Rogval is involved. He'll be speaking uh, soon. Uh, so it's a bit of airline and it's a lot of Lisp, actually. So Lispers are almost like you guys. Um, and we make mobile broadband 30% faster. And it works. It really does it. Accelerate mobile broadband. It works for uh, 3G, LTE, WiMAX, Wi-Fi, um, managed buffer bloat. It honestly works. Product works, it's stable, it's solid. And it takes a while to persuade telecom operators to buy stuff from a stupid little startup, right? So we now have two references and three handshake deals and 18, I think it is, trials requested. So 18 trials requested is a pain. It means that we just spread over the world now. 
accelerating, and it works, and it's Luke's idea. Um, it's a good idea. It's a great idea, and I'm happy. I have no, this is another one of those gangs, right? It's a gang like you guys, so I'm not going to leave if I can possibly help it. Um, but I'm doing a few things a little bit better than I did in Bluetail. I hope, thank God, I've learned something in 12 years. We're about evenly balanced between tech and sales. There are nine sales rep, two, two internal uh, people who are mostly sales, so that makes 11, and we're a total of 20, right? So we're almost, almost even. A little bit more sales. But then more of the salespeople work part-time. So, so Techland Networks. I'm having a good time, right? It's two years and I'm having a good time and maybe it'll work. So, but what the problem with Techno Networks is, is that customers, okay? When you're building a company, if you can choose it, you want to have a fair number of customers, not too few and too powerful, just a, a fair number. Telecom operators, it was a bit of a, that's the problem. I mean, there are only, what, 1,200 in the world. Uh, they're, they, they, they're in groups, called operator groups, and you can, uh, so really not 1,200, it's more like 400, and that's a bit too few customers, honestly, for a company, because they have more power than you'd like them to. They'll be able to negotiate better than you want them to. They'll, they'll depress prices and get things and whatever. It's a bad idea. That is Techlo Network's weakness. I'd say there really aren't very many more. Um, I've been a startup course leader, and um, one of the things that's really important is to take a look at that, right? How many customers do you have? Klarna had a whole bunch of them. Uh, we thought there were 2,000 uh, e-shops in Sweden at the time. There maybe were. Uh, there are a lot more customers than that at the moment. I really don't know how many, um, but lots. And each one, if you miss one, it isn't deadly. If you, if you say the wrong thing or, or give them the wrong price, it isn't deadly in, in in Klarna, it is rather bad in Teclo because you don't have, you don't have enough customers. So Klarna, customers, marketing to consumers, if you have an idea like that, it's expensive, I've done it. Um, it's uh, usually the rule is the share of the amount of money you spend out of the total amount of money that everybody spends is the market share you get. Share of voice is share of market, okay? So when you're competing against, say, Johnson & Johnson, it's a bad idea. <laughs> okay. So that was another bad idea with Ellen. We competed basically against Johnson & Johnson, and so, so marketing was very expensive. Um, think about it. If you're doing a consumer, maybe social networking has changed this map and made an opportunity where it's possibly cheaper to reach consumers. It's possible. I, lots of people are betting on it, maybe, I don't know, but generally no. So watch it on the customers, okay. Okay, another one, another mistake I've made called substitute technology, something coming in that was going to kill you. I had a company, I invested in a company which did casual gaming. You're standing at the bus stop and you're pretty bored and you bring out your phone and you do something like Sudoku on it for five minutes, right? Great idea. Perfect. I do it all the time, only I buy my games from the App Store, right? We didn't have the App Store. This was started before the App Store, but just before the App Store. And, uh, well, <laughs> didn't work very well because operators don't actually get to sell very many uh, games to people outside of the App Store and the Android Store. Really. Nowadays, maybe a little bit wilder, but there was a period when nothing was sold outside the App Store, and that killed this game, this company called Teclo, or Telco Games. All right, so timing. It was a great idea, but uh, we died. Same way with Panopticon, great idea, fantastic technology, and we sold to the finance industry, and well, the finance industry just about died. All right, bad, bad timing. Hmm? Uh, we had a physics motor uh, for gaming called Mechon, where you can, you can set parameters. So, okay, the gravity in my virtual world is this, the friction is this, uh, and the air thickness is this, and then if I then throw a virtual glass of water against a virtual wall, uh, then the water will spread like this, right? And the fabric will flutter behind a person running like this, right? 
very f cool stuff, extremely cool stuff, and it used an awful lot of floating point calculations, as you can imagine. So we sold it to somebody who really wanted it, which was a floating point chip maker. Stupid. Very stupid. Uh, floating point chip makers are basically dead because the people doing graphics board took over that, right? And when, you, when making a chip, it seems that there's around, a, if you make a mistake when making the chip, it takes around 18 months before you can get the next one wrong going. And 18 months is an eon in the gaming situation, in the gaming uh, industry. So we were there, and we had this great, cool technology, and we could have sold it to a graphics card maker, or we could sell it to the chip maker, and we sold it to the chip maker. Stupid. Chip maker went bankrupt. We all lost our money. And unfortunately, uh, the, competitor, the competitors, uh, Physics Motor won because they weren't in the part of a bankrupt company. And it's really not as good technology. Really, really not. And that's too bad. The best technology doesn't win. Um, okay. So that was substitute technology. Instead of needing a chip, you can use a whole graphics card. Oops. Oops. Another thing is watch out for the government, okay? Not necessarily your own government, but somebody's government. Ellen, uh, once again, medical technology. Medical technology is bloody scary, right? Uh, because it takes forever to get something approved, and, by that, and, and the rivalry is really, really strong, so that people will steal patents and steal computers and, and, and try to copy stuff. It's really it's tough business. And the regulators who decided whether what we did was a medicine or a uh, equivalent to a Band-Aid couldn't agree with each other. And so in different countries, we had different regulatory regimes to follow. And the ones who required that it would be a medicine, you know, that, that means human testing and, and many, many millions. And the, one, and the ones who thought we were like a Band-Aid, they were at each other's throats. It was really hard to find what markets we could get into where we're safe to sell. Okay? That's governmental problem. That's regulators at each other's throats making a difference. Medical technology is a bit like that. It's not only that. There's a government called China. Okay? China wants into the solar cell industry. As a matter of fact, it's basically buying the solar cell industry at the moment. I have a solar cell company called Midsummer. Really cool technology. What you do is you use this, the machines that you used to use to make CDs and DVDs and sputter onto them and make them solar cells instead of CDs. It's really good because you've already followed the technology curve down to really cheap uh, for the solar cells, right? Because you follow them for the CDs. So it's really cheap technology and we're still cheaper than the Chinese, but those margins I love so much, they're gone. It's still profitable, but it's not, you know, print one and sell it for 10 times what you printed it for, right? It's more like print one and sell it point 1.35 or 1.5 times what you sold it for, which is not nearly as good. Okay. China's bought that. China is pushing everybody out of the solar cell business. They're buying the technology, they're investing in companies, they're making sure that people can sell solar cells for much less than their production costs in order to push everybody else out of the business. Okay. They're doing the same thing. The midsummer is surviving, okay. It's okay, because we're still cheaper than anybody else. Uh, China's doing the same thing with the telecoms industry. I hope you know that. Okay. Nortel's dead. That was, of course, a bookkeeping problem or five. Uh, Alcatel-Lucent is close to dead. Motorola is dead. Siemens, Nokia Siemens is not doing well. And honestly, I'm going out and talking to numbers and numbers and numbers of telecom operators I've met. I've talked in detail to, let's call it, 40 or 50 operators the last three months. I have met no one who has any Ericsson equipment. None. Okay, watch it. What they do is they bought, they put money into Huawei and to ZTE, and a cash-strapped operator, and they're all cash-strapped, basically, the ones I talk to, at least, um, get to have an entire radio network for free. As long as the um, 
that operator buys everything else they need for their radio network through Huawei. So Huawei then knows what's necessary more than what they already have. Okay, and then what do they do with that knowledge? Well, they copy whatever it is that they would, what else is necessary, right? So that's pretty scary. That's scary for techno networks. I think it's pretty scary for Sweden because of Ericsson. Um, I don't know that we can actually do much about it, but I think what we can do is try to pull together a bit um, and realize that the threat is there. It's out there. It's big. Okay. I have not met anybody with any Ericsson equipment yet. Two and a little over two years at Techco. Okay, the first year I didn't meet many people, but really now. Who away are a bunch of smart people? And they have the government backing. And China wants high tech industry in order to bring up to bring themselves up into the middle income sector, up into the upper income sector. And they would like solar power and they would like telecommunications. Uh, two good choices. Um, hmm? I've heard that uh, European operators have decided to buy enough from Ericsson so that Ericsson will survive. That reminds me of once upon a time I was at a company named Digital and the big competitor was called a company called IBM. And uh, companies decided to buy enough from Digital so that IBM wouldn't be too uppity, right? Digital's dead. Um, right, barriers to entry. Who away is now building a huge barrier to entry? They, they, uh, if they give away a whole radio network and you can only buy stuff, well, then it's really hard for anybody else than who away to actually get there, right? And any new products that the operators buy get immediately copied by who away. It's also patents, okay? Now, patents have turned into a horrible thing in this kind of a group because you see patent trolls everywhere. You see people really misusing them. Okay. But without them, if you don't have any kind of a barrier to entry, in other words, if you're doing well and somebody says, ooh, they're doing well, let me copy them, and they can easily, well, they will, and the value of your company goes down and your jobs disappear generally. Yeah. So it's pretty necessary to have some kind of a barrier to entry. Patents help, they're not perfect, because people can write around them, right? Uh, if you have patents, you can at least, if somebody attacks you, you can at least trade, right? You can use our patent if we can use your patent. Uh, there are, Twitter is starting to do something where the people who own the patent can say that this patent can only be used defensively and not offensively in case it ends up in the hands of a patent troll. Um, there are things one can do to protect oneself, but it's really a good idea to have some. It's a terrible thing, but you need some barriers to entry and patents are one of them. Another one is brand names. Um, it's easier to buy faster TCP IP over old mobile broadband from Ericsson than it is from Techno Networks, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> it would be nice to be called Ericsson rather than Techno Networks uh, in sales, but we're not. Um, customer relations are a big one. Um, people who trust you and say that uh, we want to buy from you, we like you, you trust you, your products are good, we have a long relationship, we can work with you. Um, if you have a lot of those, that's valuable, that's a barrier to entry, because somebody else coming in and trying to sell to those same people will, will meet, you know, no, we're not really interested, we, we buy from those people instead. Pretty hard to break. What I've noticed in, around here, this group, this lovely group, is that there's speed of development and sure, sheer just, product quality. Synapse is like that, I believe, uh, although Synapse, I believe, also has a patent. Um, Bluetooth was certainly like that. We had no patents because we went, it went too fast. We decided rather, rather to develop something really good than to get a patent on it. Um, around here, this gang can do that. It's pretty impressive. You're competing against uh, the other six billion people or seven billion people on the planet. You can do it. Not many people can, but it's nice to have, okay? Um, you can also have something called network effects. That helps, but that's only when you're huge. Uh, that's what killed, really, uh, the casual gaming company, is that it was so much easier. Everybody was in the app store, and then why, why do anything else? So barriers to entry. Help. 
And then another thing I did absolutely wrong was we didn't sell to the right people. Selling companies to the right people is a really important thing. Okay? And some of you will have already sold companies and others haven't, but please check. Okay? We thought we were selling to Altium Web Systems, which was a gang of people we knew and sort of trusted. Okay? Well, at the time, they were selling themselves to Nortel, which was a gang of people we neither knew but sort of trusted because they were sort of like Ericsson. Right? Well, we shouldn't have. Nortel was a bunch, well, the, the top management of Nortel was perfectly awful. Okay. It's too bad. I didn't get to stay around. I lost my gang of you. Um, Agia, the, the, this company that we uh, sold the, the sixth thing, also terrible idea. They went bankrupt. Take a look at their books. Take a look at their idea. See if the company you're selling yourself to is actually worth anything over time. If you th and you also th look at the entrepreneurial gang and see if this works. Um, coastal Contacts, we sold Lensway to something called Coastal Contacts. It worked not at all. Okay. Well, why did we sell Lensway? Well, there was no money around. Well, not much. So we needed money because people pay their bills at the end of the month, and uh, Lensway needed to pay its salary at, on the 25th of every month. And right around the first of the month, we had just incredible amounts of money, and then it went slowly down and slowly down, and, slowly, and then we needed to pay our own um, salaries, and at that point, we needed to borrow money, and then it went up again over three days. Right? And the banks refused to, to give us enough money for that, to cover the 25th, 26th month. So we had to sell. Okay, we found a partner on the other side of the Atlantic. We thought that was a good idea because uh, opticians who were getting killed by internet lenses could possibly uh, get the European Union to regulate so that you can't sell lenses over the internet, or they could do it in the United States and Canada, but probably not both at the same time. We were watching out for the government. We saw it turned out that Coles Contacts uh, took all the money that was made in Europe and spent it on Whistler vacations, sort of thing. Um, not so good. And big conflicts. And we tried a manage or the, we tried a management buyout back again, and it didn't work. War, basically war. Okay. So. I've sold a couple companies to the right people, but not often. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's much better to try to grow yourself, honestly. Um, okay, so what I'm saying basically as you hear is that, look, you can start companies. You can do it. You can build a product. You have the idea. You probably ought to build a team around it with about a few of the commercial people to balance you. But you have ideas. You can build products. This is amazing. Okay. It is absolutely amazing. You can do it. Okay, and you have, obviously, you know the technology which will make your systems reliable, which is also very good. Okay, well, why wouldn't you do this? Okay, well, maybe you can't find enough commercial people. Quite possible. Nobody in CS Lab had ever met anybody like me before. She will never fit in, and I never did, really. Um, well, they exist. There are, in Sweden, in Stockholm, entrepreneurial mingle parties where you've got a bunch of people with badges on all looking hungrily for an idea. It's true, they, they exist. They, my, my daughter goes to them and she's, oh, there's like 50 people of them and nobody has an idea and they're all looking at each other hoping that somebody's gonna say something. And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's um, the Stockholm School of Economics has something called, there's a Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship. Okay. Those are people from KTH and Stockholm School of Economics and Konsfak and Stockholm University, right? Almost all the people there are commercial. They have very few technical people there, and their ideas in general are completely abysmal. They're nothing like yours. Okay, they're let's make another tailored shirt on the internet company. What is that? The thousandth, twelve hundredth, something like that. Not much fun. Um, but they're there. These are people like me, no ideas, but we can make companies. Can't build a product, no ideas, but mm -hmm, can do stuff. Um, okay, so you can get commercial people. The commercial people sometimes come to me and say, how do I meet people that are really techie? And I say, well, I don't, I don't know, you gotta be lucky. Or the places that I go, I can drink beer, that I can go there and like find them. <laughs> um, 
I don't think so. There's hang gliding, I suppose. You could do that, right, Leonard? <laughs> but uh, where do you, so if you can find out, if you can tell me where groups of you gather, I will tell the commercial people where to go and try to pick you up. <laughs> it's really, it's about like that, right? Um, another objection is the best product never wins and it's always the, the bad guys who win and, and commercial people are not, not to be trusted. Well, yeah, okay. In the same way that I can smell nowadays, not smell, but I can feel that who is a really good techie, a little bit, at least. I have some feel for it. Not much, but some. Um, many of you probably have no idea what a good commercial person feels like, right? Get references. Personal references. Because the way a good techie is a good techie is they can build products, right? And they have good ideas. The way a good com commercial person is a good commercial person is that they build companies well that are profitable generally, and where the techies get a fair share of the company, and nobody gets cheated. Okay? A lot of commercial people are out there to cheat. Same way there are an awful lot of uh, web programmers out there. Okay? They're, they're bads of every, everything. Okay? But you take references. Um, Right. Another objection is all these startups, they fail, right? Jane, you've been so damn lucky. Out of your 11, five are world-class companies, and three we don't know yet, but probably pretty good, okay? Three failures so far. That's amazing, you're so lucky, you're so amazing. I'm not, okay? I'm not. It's never my idea. Your ideas are just as good as the ones that mine are, okay? It's not that. You can also think about what the definition of a failure is. From a venture capital perspective, it's a failure if it doesn't make around 100, 10 to 100 times the money in around 10 years, okay? Well, I think that's a screaming success. That's maybe Klarna, right? But you don't have to be Klarna to have a successful company. If you're looking for building interesting stuff and having customers you really like, and making a good income and being able to afford a summer place and feeling secure and having a good retirement and uh, maybe having a company of, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people. That, to me, sounds like a roaring success. Okay? Maybe not out of a VC, but it is a success. It is a good life. People who have companies that are fairly small tend to be, in general, there's good research showing this, tend to be, in general, happier than the people who don't. It's a matter of happiness, life quality, and yes, it works. It's not impossible, and especially not for you guys, okay? Really not. Think about it. Yeah. Um, another thing you probably think is it's too much bloody work, and it is, okay? There you go, it is. Completely agree, I'm two years, a little bit over two years into tech row, and I'm tired. I'm always tired about two years in. Around about three years in, I generally, I hope not this time, but I'm generally out. Um, and then I'd say, I'm going to go and pension. I'm going to be retired now. This is it. Uh, this is it. I want to be, I'm going to take care of dogs and have honeybees and nothing else. I never do, but this is always my dream. Why do I feel that way? Because it's so damn much work. It really is a lot of overtime for about two years to get it going. Three, maybe. Okay. Right. How many of you actually work overtime today? I would say most of you do, right? Yeah, so you'd work for yourself instead. Or for your group, basically, for your team. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work. If you, if you actually are one of these people, like many people I know who really can't do a lot of work over a couple of years, do a marathon like that, then no, maybe you shouldn't. But then I don't think you'd be here because learning airline and coming here, that requires that you've actually spent a fair amount of your free time learning something very difficult, not just watching TV. Okay? So you actually are capable of this if you want to, all of you. Um, another objection, we really, it's better to launch through big companies. And it is. If you have a product that you can get, that, and you can build it in Ericsson, and Ericsson pu can push it out, that's lovely, and you can do it. And Ericsson can generally push it out. It's perfect. Um, 
It's just that big companies also need to focus. I believe that Klarna at this moment has three products, okay? Billing, a, an account, and this new kind of billing thing. Three. It's been seven years, three products, right? Klarna isn't a very big company, three is pretty many. Um, big companies need to focus so that you'll often not get space for your idea in a big company. Um, they won't want to do that because really their strategy is to do solar cells. And they're not going to do solar cells uh, that, are, that are, they're only going to do solar cells that make power. They're not going to do ones that do the thermal heating. You know, just, no, that's not our strategy. We won't do that. And you have this wonderful idea and you're not going to get it out there. So you have a wonderful idea that you really care about and it doesn't fit into the company you're working at strategy. It's not going to happen there. So what are you going to do with it? Send it on a postcard to your friends? Um, <clears throat> very frustrating. That was amazing, guys. Um, another thing is that there is a belief that if you are loyal to your employer, your loyal employer will be loyal to you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It doesn't exactly work anymore, but it was that way maybe 30, 40 years ago, right? And if... And, and big companies would reasonably offer more loyalty than, lo than small ones. I don't find that to be the case, to put it mildly. Okay? Uh, I find that if you're a group of six, and, or 10, or 12, or 20, like we are at Tecla right now, that we know everything. We know that, that Alex's birthday is next week. Kid Alex, right? Sean's son. Um, there, we know an awful lot of stuff about each other, and we know that Jane is, for instance, having a speech here, so not gonna, we're not going to call Jane today. We, we, we know about each other, we care about each other, we know whose dog is sick, we know who's, got, who's thinking about a puppy, who's got hamster, we know everything and we care about it, right? We know that Yuho was up late last night, so um, don't, he's having a nap, don't wake him up, it's okay, we'll fix. Um, that's loyalty, right? I haven't noticed that in the bigger companies I've worked for, the kind of really caring about each other groups, unless the group has been like the CS lab, where it's been steady for quite a while. And often they aren't in the big companies. So that's another reason you can't expect is that there's a problem with financing, right? How the hell am I going to get started? I have no money, or you, know, you, you have no money, or you, don't, you need to get something working in order to sell it the first time, and it's just a, there's a problem with starting, right? Well, first of all, you all have an incredible advantage because you're doing software. You don't need to build a factory. You don't need to buy a shop. You don't need to buy inventory. You just need to sit down and program something, right? You read on what it is and sit under. So that's a very cheap way of starting. Very cheap. So you've got an amazing advantage there. Um, the other thing is that Sweden is actually number three in the world in the amount of venture capital there is available per capita. First comes the States, then comes Israel, then comes Sweden, actually. There is money out there. Less than there was. It's hard to get, but it's there. People actually come to Sweden and try to pick up uh, entrepreneurial companies, find them. However, they can't find you guys. They have the same problem. They're commercial, and they don't know where to find you. Not really. But they're there. It's, it's not easy. But thank goodness your ideas don't generally require a huge amount of money to start them. And when you have something that's starting to roll, then it's easy to get money. So financing, yeah, it's a problem, but it's not that bad. Mm? All right, so what I guess I really want to say to you all, and I would say it because I've done this now 11 times, you can do it. You have the ideas. You can build the products. You have the skills. You've got skills that other people are just dying to meet you as the rolling, rolling, old, old Rolling Stones. I know I've got a bunch of Puerto Rican girls who are just dying to meet you. Well, I've got a bunch of commercial people who are just dying to meet you. Okay? There is that. There is the possibility of building a team. And, you know, having companies, it's a lot of fun. It's like having a baby. 
sort of, you know, you care about it, you think about it, you say, oh, maybe I should do this, or what's going on. It's really a lot of fun. It's not hard. It's not harder work than you already do. Right? And it can be quite profitable. Um, I'd say a fair number of us in this room can say that, yeah, it's profitable. It works. You can do it. And that's really what I want to say about how to do this. Um, please do it, okay? It would be so much fun to have airline be part of even more startups, have a gang, more, more of you become independently wealthy. It's fun. Why not? Go for it. Bye-bye.